All right, well, welcome to our final episode in the Cosmos Trilogy excerpt series. Um, this time we're going to be looking at excerpt G. And today we have uh, two special people joining us when uh, they heard we were planning to do a discussion of excerpt G. Um, Matt Cranheader and Michael Garfield both reached out and said that they would like to take part in this discussion. I think it's a, a really interesting opportunity. I think both of them have some interesting connections to the excerpts and to this particular one. So in a minute, I want to give a little summary of, of part of the text. But first, I want to turn it over to Matt and Michael, both of you, to say a little bit just about what your interest is in the excerpts, and in particular, this one, and why you wanted to join in the conversation. So my background with um, subtle energies, energetics, um, came primarily through my study of chiropractic and acupuncture. Uh, about a decade ago, um, I did simultaneous doctorate and master's programs in those two things. And I ended up spending a decade or so practicing a type of chiropractic called network spinal analysis, which was developed by a man named Donald Epstein and developed specifically from an integrally informed perspective. So this chiropractic uh, modality was really kind of living at the crossroads of the neurology and the energetics. And most of it was focused on helping people come into better alignment with um, the part of them that was waking up from a, a subtle energetic perspective and the correlation with their transformation and their personal health. So there was a lot of experience and, and over a decade, I think I performed about 20,000 healing sessions, mostly with entrepreneurs and people who are really looking at energetically living at their leading edge. So there was a lot of background in understanding kind of the true nature of how energetics work in people. And integral was my frame because the work was integrally informed, but also because there was so many people where I live in Southern California that were coming in from a postmodern, really green perspective and telling me all about their ascension sickness and their awakening process. And now all of these like important lovely steps and stages but were really disconnected from what was actually happening in their body so excerpt g became a, a big part of how i helped to frame some of the breakthroughs that they needed to have in order to uh, understand how they needed to take their next step damn <laughs> i'm gonna be the fool in this conversation because <laughs> In spite of the fact that I read Excerpt G while I was in graduate school under Sean S. Bjorn Hargens at JFKU, studying integral multimethodological pluralism and, you know, going for what at the time was the first graduate degree in integral theory. I haven't read this thing in, in 15 years. Actually, I pulled an all nighter last night to prepare myself for this call. Also, because I have a, uh, an eight, month old baby who wants me to take him out on walks at 4 a.m. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's the way that I, I kind of commune with suchness these days. But I also, you know, I came into Ken's work and actually I'm on record with this, uh, confronting him <laughs> at the uh, inner life practice seminar in 2005 about some, uh, mischaracterizations he'd made about the state of evolutionary biology in his work, uh, which really complicated things for me when I presented his work to the head of my natural history museum at the University of Kansas while I was seeking a an interdisciplinary graduate program in the inter, like integral evolutionary biology. And ultimately what happened was, you know, Sean Hargens told at the told me at the time is 2007 that I was uh, a shoe in, I guess it was 2008, a, a shoe in to teach, to be the, like teach integral evolutionary biology, but that there was an administrative sort of cart before the horse thing where I was a student in the program. And so I couldn't actually teach the class that I needed to take in order to get the credentials in order to teach the class. So uh, I found myself in a bind and he, he and I tried to resolve it by getting me an administrative tuition waiver, but then the school changed their policies on that. And so I dropped out of the program, spent 13 years as an artist and musician touring the world. And uh, in that time wrote 
for a, a non-duality publication called Globalish, hosted by mm. uh, Michael Richardson Bourne, uh, where I was writing like 98% of their content for a year and uh, presented that stuff to Ken. And, and Ken, at one point uh, in August of 2015, in his uh, Denver loft said that 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 work was like the only ultraviolet cultural commentary he'd ever seen, um, which is great. You know, I don't think he knew that I had written it. He was because Michael had Richardson had stripped all of the attributions off of the website in some quest to uh, speak as a non-duality brand, which ultimately <laughs> imploded the whole project. Um, but and, and then I ended up at SFI, where now I work in science communications and I study complex systems. Uh, I drink from the fire hose of complexity science research in order to communicate it to the general public on a daily basis. So that's where I am now, uh, in, some, in some sense, in a, uh, a state of hyper-intellectual fallen grace. And, and so I'm, I'm really glad to meet you because this is, uh, I, I suspect I should come to SoCal and get worked by you, sir. Uh, anyway, thanks. Yeah, so I wanted to just say a little bit on on how Ken launches this document because it's at least nominally situated in what he's you know wanting to establish with all the excerpts, which is this post metaphysical, more naturalistic uh, framing of integral theory, uh, but also more up to date with postmodern insights. So he starts out looking at the the great chain of being model and considers both its its truthfulness and its utility, but also some of the limitations from modern and postmodern points of view. In particular, he is arguing that the, you know, the great chain in placing matter on the bottom rung creates problems for uh, modern and, and, and postmodern understandings. One of the implications, for instance, is if, if matter is the very bottom rung of being and, and the you know subtle feelings and, and and forms of consciousness are higher than the feelings of a worm are higher than you know the enormously complex human brain and that doesn't make a lot of sense so he's already been doing this all along with really the aqua model the four quadrants but he reiterates that an integral perspective would be that matter is not the bottom rung but the outside that it's the outside of every perspective and every level, and that it goes all the way up and down. So he he posits this sequence of, of levels of, of form and matter and corresponding you know, types of consciousness. So that's his second step there, following Teilhard de Chardin, kind of the second proposed solution to the integration of, of the great chain within a modern context is to say, that with every complexification of matter and form, there's a corresponding depth of consciousness and uh, you know subjectivity. And that this goes, again, all the way up and all the way down. And then the next step he wants to make, especially related to subtle energy, because again, in the traditional systems, at least a lot of them, you know, there's the gross matter, you know, um, but then every other energy is a metaphysical energy. It, it's, it's beyond matter. And it's, uh, again, not something that, that science would be very comfortable with. And so what he posits instead is that with every complexification in you know, matter and form, there's the corresponding complexification of consciousness and the depth of consciousness, but there's also a corresponding subtilization of energy that increasingly subtle forms of energy are associated with increasingly complex forms of matter. So, you know, only up in, you know, the triune brain, for instance, do you have something like causal energy becoming available, a causal energy body becoming available. So that's his proposed post-metaphysical resituation of the great chain. There's something to it that I think is a bit similar to something that David Bohm put forward with his model of soma significance and signosomatics. And basically, you know, he wanted to use the word soma as body, uh, but meaning form that, that for, every, for every shape of existence, there's a corresponding meaning dimension. 
and there's associated energy. So he, he makes a tripolar model of form or soma, meaning and energy at, at, in, in different layers of complexity throughout existence. So that's uh, interplay of soma significance and sigma somatics. Every, every meaning is embodied and every body is meaningful and energetic. So I, th- I see a correlation there. Uh, and, but Wilbur later on in the document is critical of, of Bohm and maybe we can come back to that. Uh, so that's pretty much the framing I wanted to offer because from here, as Wilbur has introduced this idea that, that a post-metaphysical handling of subtle energy would situate it within increasing complexifying form and correlate it with that, he then launches into a deeper discussion of what's involved in, you know, what is subtle energy and what's involved in an integral framing of it. And he offers some, uh, you know, novel ways to classify it and, and think about it. Um, and so that's that's all I'll do for the setup. And I'd like to you know, ask you, Layman, what you'd like to, to say in terms of uh, introduction and framing. I want to applaud Wilbur for working on this topic. Um, you know, as somebody who's spent a lot of time in subtle energy communities and practices and experiments, I appreciate the difficulty of the challenge. It's, it's very easy for people to either dismiss the domain of this phenomenology entirely or to treat it as something nebulous that simply works and doesn't require any careful philosophical thinking. Trying to solve problems around subtle energy in a coherent, consistent way is tough, and it doesn't get support from almost anybody. I've, I have a term in my head, which is invisibilitis, which is the tendency of to us to treat things that are hard to see as either completely non-existent or as equivalent to all other things that are hard to see. And you pick up books and they'll say God or spirit or chi or the life force or whatever you want to call all of that, right? And, and that doesn't lead us forward to any kind of clarity. So the, the most minimal thing we could expect is to start to try to make some basic distinctions. And I love that he does that. Like one of the things he does in this section is make a very clear distinction in his own mind between, say, quantum phenomena, which he associates with prana rather than spirit. Right. And it's way too easy to conflate domains like that merely because they're both invisible. I also think this is an exciting chapter. Phrases like toward a theory of subtle energies or a natural history of subtle energies, those are phrases that turn me on immensely. I think the premise of this section is is really uh, an essential extension of Wilbur's basic ideas. I think if you take that tetradic four-quadrant approach and decide that collectives aren't more inclusive than individuals and that subjectivity is neither purely emergent nor the fundamental thing about reality, that these things all have to co-arise and co-entangle, then the natural extension of that in an approach to subtle energies is to look for correlations between some form of subtle consciousness and some form of subtle materiality. So it seems very consistent, and I think it's a very interesting move, and it Uh, behooves us to explore what this good thinker comes up with when he applies that lens. And I think what he comes up with here is not a dogma, but a set of informed suggestions about people going forward, trying to theorize in this domain. It's not, uh, it's not dumb to suggest that a model of subjective experiences of unusual phenomenon should be partly decoupled from the traditional social interpretations that they've been instantiated in and partly newly correlated to um, contemporary ideas about non-reductive material science. So any integrative alchemist should be at least sympathetic to his overall strategy here. I appreciate that sentiment. And that, that'll, that'll help me temper my, my disquiet <laughs> with, this, <laughs> with this piece. <laughs> Because it is, I don't know, it's, it, that has been just the thing with with Ken is there's there's a there's a point in this in this piece, and I, I don't want to just get lost in the weeds right away, but there's a point in this piece where he's talking about the boiling point of water, and he says it's 180 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like what the fuck are you talking about? Like it's 212. And of course, it goes down as you escalate in altitude. But I looked up the NASA 
uh, gradient for this. And you would have to be living on the top of Mount Everest, I think, for it to be 180 degrees, which suggests to me that Ken is actually operating somewhere up in the mesosphere. <laughs> and, and from up there, just as he claims, uh, it's impossible to spot some of the details on the ground. And I think that's like evident throughout this document that as always, he's he's got some real brilliant insights here also, but uh, you have to be careful to step around. You cannot take his certitude at face value. He speaks with an authority that, uh, you know, is backed, I guess, by the library, which I visited in his house. It's impressive. It's daunting. But uh, I, I doubt that anyone can actually remember everything that they've read. And uh, so he, I, 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 don't, I, I don't care to be this person throughout the entire call, but I'll just say that he's frequently critiqued by experts in the domains that he speaks about with authority as a synthesist. Uh, and then fails to address those critiques. So, and I think that some some of that's going on in this. But I'm not myself an expert in subtle energy systems. So, Matt, I'm going to leave that one in your in your court to to talk about that. Um, I overall, I think that this this paper is worth revisiting. And gosh, you know, after 15 years, it strikes me that it is one of the one of the dominant feelings I had on rereading it was that it was so incredibly formative and that looking back on it, so much of it strikes me as common sense or just, you know, it's, 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 it's at hand. It's second nature. A lot of what he's saying seems rather evident, uh, in, in hindsight, but I, I don't know that I would feel that way if it were not for him. So, you know, my work is less academically informed, perhaps, and maybe less academically rigorous and more kind of what are the useful ways of participating with these subtle energetics that are, have obvious implications in a person's transformational you know, evolutionary process. So that's the, the kind of a fundamental frame that I've been operating from with this document. And I think it's just tremendously useful to, you know, in, in the way that Lehman was speaking, like having the right orienting relationship between what quantum actually is, where it lives and what it means. Um, and then just giving people a functional understanding of the, the different states and how they correlate to the interiors and the exteriors that has been, massively awakening, I think, for many of the people that I've been working with, because they get lost in the trap of, of what is quantum, what does quantum mean, and, and then understanding that complexity is, you know, kind of the, the foundational nature of how we hold more spirit. So I, I would say that my kind of, uh, I'm, I might be 10,000 foot view, and some of the nuances I might be, you know, less contributing towards, but taking the, the general spirit of the excerpt has been tremendously useful for guiding people through, you know, the, the, the weeds of how do I heal? How do I grow? How do I evolve? How do I move forward? Yeah. I didn't mention in my summary of his uh, opening, you know, statements there was one of the dimensions that he wanted to bring in uh, in addition to the modern scientific one about, you know, evolving complexity of form is also the situatedness of our perspectives. And so he wants to bring in the, the postmodern contributions about the contextuality and the co-construction of our experience. And that a lot of what the ancients took to be metaphysical truths, uh, he would not question them as, as actually having been something real in terms of the living experience of those people, but he would say that a lot of the things that they took to be metaphysically given were in fact historically uh, situated and culturally mediated. It's not that they were, you know, incorrect or invalid, but they were historically, you know, situated and that we are in a different historical time and cultural situation and we're called now to begin to reinterpret 
uh, what, what's involved in these phenomena that he, I think, phenomenologically doesn't question the validity of them in terms of their, their availability to experience and their impact on our own, you know, psychic and energetic organization, right? And I think that's what maybe you're t- touching on there, Matt, and also Michael is, is uh, we have a lot of popular media out there about, you know, correlating spirituality to quantum phenomena. And, you know, so that's this attempt to kind of reinterpret the domain, um, but maybe it's not being done carefully enough. So I think that's one thing that Ken is wanting to do with this paper and some of his other work is, can we can we build a, a realistic, you know, model of, of subtle energies that takes account of modern science and, and, and quantum realities and things like that, but doesn't do it in a careless way that that is easily shot down as, as someone like uh, Chopra often is, right? So, like I was saying, I I very much appreciate that attempt that he's making, and I think that the pieces he puts in play are pieces that we need in order to figure out how to think about this more carefully. Uh, some of his style and emphasis can be a little bit misleading, or at least is a little bit. Um, uh, dissonant with some of my own intuitions. I feel that he leans a little bit too much into a, a synoptic summary of the ancient traditions. Like when you read this chapter, you know, we go through a lot of what the traditions tell us before we start to do any critical thought at all. And you could be, you wouldn't really be blamed for assuming that that's what he's really trying to say is that the traditions were correct. And I think there are ways in which we need to Um, use contemporary thinking to revalidate a lot of the phenomenology that the ancients were dealing with. But I also think he leans a little bit too heavily in that direction uh, and incorporates too much from the the big traditional theorists who catch his eyes. Like one of the things that always stands out for me is, yes, it's fantastic that we're going to say that matter is not the bottom, matter is the outside. But there's still built into this um, vertical spectrum, this idea that there's some kind of maturing complexification from gross to subtle to causal to non-dual, which, I mean, it strikes me as being a little bit too cozy with uh, anti-naturalistic, anti-embodiment cultural assumptions from the axial age, right? I would... I would press that Wilbur Combs matrix idea even farther than Wilbur takes it and try to say that these energies and these domains are all co-primary and all on the same plane and not, not emerging the same way. Just like I would tend to think of the chakras, which I do think we need to re-theorize and take seriously something that we mean by chakras, but the idea that they are somehow like emergent levels is off-putting to me. I think they're much more like what he would call lines of intelligence because we have all of them all the time. And most of the spines in nature are horizontal, not vertical. So I have some, uh, some reluctance about biases that might be built into all of the old cultural assumptions that show up in a, a synoptic summary of the traditional approaches interesting that you bring that up because one of the things that I took issue with back in the day uh, was precisely this kind of what what you're saying is also reflected in the way that people talk about the emergence of the biosphere from the lithosphere, the noosphere from the biosphere, you know, and so on. And that has always struck me as uh, akin to the philosophical fault that is at the heart of the the so-called soft problem of consciousness. He's here addressing the hard problem, right? Which is this, that, you know, the, how do we, you know, there's another, there's another historical data point, which I want to include here, which is 1927 uh, book, an experiment with time by J.W. Dunn, Royal Aeronautical Engineer, J.W. Dunn, who, uh, came up with a number of things, uh, including uh, this idea of parallelism, which is essentially mind matter cor- hard correlation that that Ken is talking about in this piece. And uh, however, J. W. Dunn used that as a leverage point to get into explaining the anomaly of the copious evidence for precognitive dreams. 
And so, you know, he was, he was trying to create a holonic system in the, in the way that we would understand it in this, in the frame of this conversation in which uh, minds are nested within larger minds that have, and, and, and thus can access larger spatiotemporal scales of, uh, and, and uh, Eric Wargo has recently expanded on Dunn's work in his work, uh, time loops to, you know, to, to bring in information theory and, 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 uh, quantum mechanics specifically into this and, and to try and give it a kind of a, a material footing so that we can talk about the way that these, uh, what what Ken always thought of as the unmade future, you know, I guess that's more excerpt A, right? But like, you know, he talks about being at the frothy edge, at the you know at the front the front bow of this thing, and and seemed rather oblivious to <laughs> all of the evidence to the contrary, which is that if anything, it's like more like a, a seat at this like the inner pocket of a toroid in which the the future is revealing itself or like uh, unpacking itself and this is it's weird because this is in the this is in the piece you know talking about involution and evolution that you know involution is not only uh, a, a sort of prerequisite but it's the way that he offers in hypothesis 4 it's the way that he offers a structure for being able to talk about reincarnation as something that you know that the the complexity of material form is more like a shadow projected by the involuting higher non-dual godhead and so yeah this is you know the the idea that he he then gets kind of like stuck in this this linear time unfolding is uh for me really problematic but anyway that's that's the all the stuff that I, I felt like needed to go in there sandwiched after your your insightful comments <laughs> I don't know you know if we're gonna jump too quickly into criticism before we get into the full unpacking of it but I'm bad I about also that, have sorry, sorry. no no it's all right um I I have similar reservation in in that it seems that in the first half he kind of lays out a reframing which is trying to situate the subtle energies within matter and that matter is, you know, the material, no material world is the outside containing all the different levels. But then when he gets into the talk about the two truths and the involution and evolution and the, the moves that would need to be made in order to basically entertain the possibility of reincarnation, it feels like he almost walks all of that entirely back and ends up pretty much situated exactly in the traditional view where at the level of, of, you know, material manifestation, yes, matter looks like the outside, but in the involutionary account that he presents in a kind of linear way, all of the higher levels are existing without any reference to complex form and that they're only needed to manifest on the material plane, but they're not needed Otherwise, they all have their own bodies and they all exist in their own ways. All are essentially metaphysical again. At least that's the kind of impression that I get is that he he presents a way to maybe talk about it in the physical plane, but then all the moves he makes after that reestablishes the whole metaphysical hierarchy that was there from the beginning. There's a lot of unknowns around bioelectricity. Right, because when we think about this model he lays out, and he's going to say, "Okay, um, the exterior material energetic world is evolving in complexification and becoming subtler, and it's starting with the fundamental forces that we know about in terms of physical matter, and it's moving up in degrees toward these um, more extraordinary forms of energy." Some of the questions I have around this are. Well, what does that mean then? Is bioelectricity or bioelectromagnetism some new emergence? Because like Michael was saying, all organisms have had that all the way along. So it's not necessarily that that's a subtle refinement of the energies we're made up of. Now, you could look at it and say, well, the argument he's really making is that 
we're evolving into a social and neuropsychic level at which bioelectromagnetism can become a central player in the way we think about the world and the way we organize society. And that might indeed be a new and refined position to take. But I also am worried about the distinction between bioelectromagnetism, which I think of as a gross realm force, as an energy that has mass and matter to it and is not a subtle energy. And this is tricky when you're in therapeutics and dealing with people because it's not clear what anyone means or, or how you get different particular effects. But I would like to conceptualize the subtle as being fundamentally massless and qualitative and distinct from even seemingly subtle forms of physical electricity, which are nonetheless part of the gross realm energetics. Yeah, I think that's an, an interesting perspective. And it's always been one of the head scratchers for me. You know, we, we have these terms of SF1, SF2, SF3, which I think are valuable and useful. And then across a number of authors and disciplines, they tend to talk about it from a bio uh, electromagnetic perspective, which tends to be gross realm phenomenon. So at what point do we say, well, these and maybe there's biophotons, maybe there's other things that are happening. You know, I know the Russians are measuring lots of interesting things that if you can read Russian and read their research is certainly fascinating to look into. Um, but there, there is a, a, a mass energy that's happening in those places that we, we don't have accurate terminology for. And I think if we had accurate terminology, that would actually change the conversation quite a bit um, and help us have a different kind of certainly, I mean, from my perspective, diagnostic, but also uh, a way of understanding the where of, of where those things live, which is the big question for a lot of people when they're directly experiencing this is like, okay, where is my subtle body? And it, we know, usually it can only be a subjective upper left experience. But if we have like what that thing is and where it's existing from the upper right, now we have a really a totally different conversation that can happen. And I think it really moves the discussion forward quite a bit. This is making me wish Farsam Shadab was in on this conversation because he's <laughs> he's the one that introduced me to Mei Wan Ho and you know the the mm. the, the late science scientist of, of bioelectricity also i thought it was funny that this in this paper he mentions psychic uh i don't know michal mccall levin uh because uh curiously one of the pre the preeminent researchers of bioelectricity right now at, at at tufts university is michael levin who is doing bizarre and amazing things showing how electricity governs uh regrowth patterns and developmental uh, patterns and, and and actually this is important to to this I think to, to the point you're making layman because you know I've always had a problem with Sheldrake's kind of hand waving Rupert Sheldrake's hand waving around morphogenetic fields and it seems as though a lot of uh, it, like Michael Levin's work largely prov I mean it, it provides a superior uh, and and empirically demonstrated alternative hypothesis to what's actually going on there, which is that it's not some sort of subtle field that's governing uh, the the patterns of development that are not being, uh, that we, we don't find by picking apart the genome, you know? And so this is, you know, in the, se in the way that JW Dunn and Eric, Eric Wargo, I think, not to not to dog on Sheldrake too, who's awesome. He's awesome. It's like his his empirical work is 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 so important. But I think he's he's stuck in what you know th this induction problem of like drawing the wrong conclusions from his, his findings. When he's talking about you know the sense of being stared at or dogs knowing their owners are coming home and and that kind of stuff seems also to fit into this system in which the future is uh, implied in the present in some way. And 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 so yeah, there's I guess those are like orthogonal to each other. But I think it's, you know, th this question of, you know, what we're actually looking at and, and you know, where, uh, where are the isotherms in this thing with respect to bioelectricity? Let's just say on that are, uh, that's, that's really important. 
I think there's a tendency to get caught in simplified visual reifications of these phenomena. You know, when you read through this section, you see a drawing of a person in energy shells and you see these rungs, you're like, and they're very nice and they're very suggestive and they, they hold space for thinking. But at the same, like you're saying, um, uh, Michael, about Levin's work at Tufts, I think what he's demonstrating there is, uh, at least for all practical purposes, the kind of morphogenetic field influences we're talking about are not like a bubble of the existing shape that you that is imposing itself on the system. It's much more like complex computation, right? That he's going to say, Michael, you know, we're going to biologically print things by taking what you want and deconstructing it into a complex computation that you wouldn't recognize as the thing you're talking about. And then it's going to go through chemistry to instantiate different electrical phenomena into the cell and call forth different anatomical structures. But I think that that's really important to keep in mind is that the, the way these things really operate is going to be the way the rest of the universe really operates, which is through very complex patterns that we would not recognize as being the form that they represent and perhaps not even recognize as being patterned if they're as complex as our ability to recognize patterning. So in you know, a lot of this is a, and our ancestors must often have fallen into this. And what other choice did they have? Of course, it made sense to do it this way, but this notion of tidy levels and spheres of enclosure and the, the pre-existing morphic shape that could be as if beheld and then manifested in the world, that tends to, um, I think, lead us down the wrong slant in processing this stuff. Just briefly, I think it's because you said this, it's, it's worth noting that uh, Eric Davis is one of the, the scholars that's done a really great job of showing how actually uh electromagnetism and div divine phenomena have been conflated over the last few centuries rather persistently you know um and and so yeah you know it's 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 curious in some places in the text wilbur talks about subtle energies but in other places he talks about subtle patterning of energy and that may be a way in to connect to you know what Levin is doing at Tufts, if it, but it would call for, I think, overall, maybe a significant reframing from the visual presentation that he's giving. This is anecdotal, but thinking about, you know, you know, the research in bioelectricity and in Germany, they're doing a lot of interesting stuff in, in biophotonics. And, you know, what are we measuring and what's, you know, maybe escaping our measurement at present, but nevertheless is something real. Uh, you may have heard about uh, John Chong. You've seen his videos on YouTube. I lived in Indonesia for a year, and one of the things that I tried to do was to seek out some of the uh, energy healers and uh, you know elemental shamans there. And John Chong was one person I tried to contact. I I, I never did get personally in touch with him, but he's been studied you know, with a, a team of scientists who showed up with some instruments to see what he's doing. He has the ability when he puts in the, you know, uh, acupuncture needles, he can hold the needles and send charges through the body and the body will contract and do different things, you know, based on where he holds the needles. And he can uh, demonstrate that this is an actual force. He's in the in the filming of, of what he was doing, he was able to reach out and just touch the camera and basically shut the camera off with a pulse of energy. And it took them a while to get the camera going again. Or, you know, he did a number of things that he could reach out and, and touch uh, while he's holding one of the needles, touch one of the scientists and, and give them that energetic infusion. But they were not able to pick up anything on any of the instruments they brought that they could see something was happening. He's shutting off machinery. He's causing bodies to leap. They're feeling the, the, the charges entering their own bodies and nothing they brought to measure it picked up any kind of fluctuation. So it's a perplexing thing. And it looked like something really was happening and demonstrable and empirically there. And yet none of the instruments that they brought to measure what they thought it might be registered anything it's an interesting one and especially cross-culturally and having 
had access to not a lot of uh, Chinese practitioners, but a handful. And this is in no way disparaging anyone that I've studied with or watched or culture or anything at all. What I came to realize, and also having studied some martial arts, is that there's a culture of veneration of your teacher. Uh, and I'm, I have not seen any of John Chong's videos. But what I see, especially in the martial arts field, is a, a teacher will demonstrate a uh, technique and the student falls over because of all the energy, right? And you know that likely if that was double-blinded, that would not be happening. Um, so I, I'm always extremely curious and having seen all kinds of weird stuff happening on healing tables and in healing rooms, you know, finding that, that point where we have true metaphysical phenomenon happening and then we also have cultural fields being created and then also, interestingly recursive, you have a cultural field created that actually creates a healing response because someone has bought into what they're seeing that may or may not have initially been actual or true or real. So it's, exactly. it gets into a really interesting psychosomatic kind of uh, way of what's it actually uh, initiating the, the transformational energetic experience. It gets down to something that's extremely slippery in terms of making the normal scientific distinctions, right? Like it's very easy in some areas to go, well, was that just a psychological effect or was that a physical effect? But when you're talking, you know, was this chi or was this uh, placebo effect or was this transference? You don't know whether placebo and transference are in fact some form of chi effect or not, right? The definitions start to blur out at that scale. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I wish I could cite whose research I'm remembering, but I remember five or six years ago reading a piece of research that was saying that 70% of the placebo effect was set and setting. So you have a comfortable setting, you have someone that you trust, you have a novel experience like acupuncture, and that actually determines 70% 70 of the positive effect of placebo. So we're creating ritual, we're creating experience, and that's producing a massive amount of uh, maybe it's someone relaxing enough for chi to move. Maybe it's someone, you know, uh, actually being able to access their own chi because it's in resonance with the person. There's all kinds of things there that become really interesting uh, on this whole question of placebo and where that fits in subtle energetics. How are we conceiving of energy? We had this kind of exploration in one of my integral forums years ago about states and, and what are we thinking about states and uh, are we carrying forward some outmoded assumptions about what a state is? Um, and similarly, you know, are we, are, how sophisticated are we holding this whole idea of energy? And, you know, a lot of the times you'll hear scientists caution that people use energy in a very casual way that, that doesn't really align with what's meant in science by energy. So there may be a, you know, a vocabulary problem here of people using words in different ways and it sounds like they're, they're talking about the same thing or not. But you know, for instance, scientifically, basically energy is the availability of a system to do work, right? You know, and then there's a force which basically is, is kind of the enactment of that work, but they're not the same thing. What are we thinking about when we're talking about subtle energies? Is it, is it a patterning that affords a certain kind of work to happen? Is it, is it, is it a field uh, of something? Is it, is it, a, is it, a, are we still thinking of energy as a, a kind of subtle level of, of, of the physical where, you know, it, it's an actual discernible empirically detectable thing in itself or, I don't know. Yeah. How do you, how do you understand what I mean, energy discernible is? Discernible and physically detectable is pretty fluid at this point. I was reading yesterday this, I mean, there's one of the information conjectures, the matter energy information equivalence principle is trying to determine whether if you wipe the information out of a system that's storing digital information, that its mass might change slightly. Right. Right. So, right. There's an extreme uh, difficulty in disentangling these things. The idea that the sort of scientific definition is the availability to do work, I think, has to be supplemented by the notion of consistency, right? I think that energy really becomes a useful scientific tool when the law of conservation of energy is established, because mm -hmm. energy is an extremely abstract phenomenon. Like I, 
it's hard to believe how long it must have taken serious people to work out the idea that I ate something and X units of that something are in my body. And then I kicked a soccer ball and some of those units went into the soccer ball and it ran along and then it stopped because the rest of those units leaked out into the air or the ground. That's an extremely strange way to think. And you have to start with an arbitrary assertion of what the quantity is. But you fundamentally have to say the quantity is conserved, whatever the quantity is, and then look for places. If it doesn't look like it's conserved, then it must have leaked out somewhere else. And so I think it's not just this availability to do work or cause changes. It's the notion that you can track a conserved consistency across a set of changes that makes it energetic. Right. And, yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and that's part of my question in, in asking this is that causal energy, subtle energy, how are we able to track the conservation of that across manifestations? Well, we're clearly not there yet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> if, if this can be technologized, we're not there. But I think the opportunity to try to technologize it or to try to quantify it is really intriguing and not out of the question that there might be some kind of quality quantity conversion that might be operative at some point. Uh, but not many people have tried with any seriousness. And when we think about how many and how long it took to get any kind of quantitative chain lockdowns about even simple material phenomenon, we must assume this is this is a big task <laughs> to try to bring any kind of calculable quantification into this field. Hmm. At the same time, this, 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 inquiry kind of dog legs over into a piece that Ken wrote with Sean Espion Hargens on religion and science, uh, chapter 31 in, in some book, I think it was edited by Houston Smith or, um, but it was where they're, they're, they're looking at both external and internal inquiry modalities and explaining how the, the data sets differ, but ultimately the scientific method uh, uh, pertains or uh, you know, ob obtains in either case. And I really liked that because you know you're, it was, I think, a Hail Mary pass in his, you know, in his unification. And in that respect, you know, you can say, well, actually, and they did say uh, that, there are the wisdom traditions means by which these, you know, the transmission of causal energy from, uh, you know, adept to pupil is verified. And it's interesting to note that, I mean, I don't, I don't know, uh, about this guy's commercialization of his, his, his findings, but, uh, you know, Keith, Keith Martin Smith did this, this big study on people that were, nominated by their communities of practice as awakened and then put them all in brain scanners and plotted, you know, plotted out what he found and found that there was a, you know, what he saw four sort of successive step stepwise diminishments of activity in the default mode network, which uh, for which the outlying data point was uh, Penn state emeritus, Gary Weber, who in dialogue, uh, he's got a, a, a great series of dialogues with, with Richard Doyle, as well as a blog, Happiness Beyond Thought, uh, that I recommend to people in this conversation, if you don't know it already. But um, it's, you know, it's, it's funny because with Gary, you know, I, I got to chat with him on Zoom once, and his total lucidity, his total clarity and presence uh, was palpable even over a Zoom call. And so, you know, that's that's just an, another anecdotal point of, of note there, that there is something um, that the human body seems capable of registering. And w the fact that we have not yet necessarily determined mechanical instruments that are capable of registering it doesn't mean that we do not have means by which communities of practice can intersubjectively agree that we are in fact beholding the same thing and that there are, you know, we can say yes or no to a given validity claim. And that's what uh, a tool like the four quadrants would lead us to expect, right? That there's uh, subjective and interpersonal and behavioral, and then potentially something like an objective way to read subtle phenomena. And it can be verified in all these different domains. 
one of the things that um seems a little bit uh, unclarified in this chapter is the notion of how complete these different bodies might be at different points right? because there's a i mean you can feel ken trying to struggle with this and we all need to struggle with this to what degree is the subtle already present whatever we mean by the subtle and to what degree is it emergent right and then if i have um if i have a subtle body what does that mean is that something that's independent of my physical body and can come into some kinds of relationship with it? Or is it something that emerges out of my physical body? And if it's something that emerges or pre-exists and can come into relationship with the gross body, what is the condition of that subtle body? Is it assumed like some of our ancestors tended to depict already completely fully formed? Or is it something that has aggregate nature, something that has complexity, something that has unfoldment, something that grows. And I'm personally very partial to the challenge presented by the Gurdjieffian model, which is to say that you, you have these subtle components, but they're not necessarily integrated into an entity. And right, there might be some specific qualitative flavor that is your subtle sense, but it's more like a seed. And unless you put some actual time into harmonizing and integrating the subtle aspects of your different parts into one whole, you don't have a subtle whole. You just have a potentiality. So in his model, most people don't have souls, so to speak. Most of the people can't transmigrate. When they die, their subtle components just go back into different aspects of the subtle ecosystem, the way all the different chemicals in your body end up in different places. It's possible in his view to do that, but it's not pre-given that it's automatically all put together and fully matured. It may be something that demands processes and unfoldings of its own. This is actually in Vajrayana too. In part of the text, the way he talks about it, it, it seems you know he's discussing transmigration as the universally accepted model across the traditions. And really that's not the case, you know, in, in Hinduism, there's a, a sense of, of reincarnation or transmigration. And in Vajrayana or Buddhism, generally, it's more a concept of rebirth. And that is an aggregative phenomenon. It's not a pre-existing, fully formed thing that just moves from location to location, but an ongoing active construction. And if you, I, I've done, you know, years of, of dream yoga and sleep yoga training with a Tibetan Lama that I've talked about before. But one of the things that they talk about is the development of the dream body or the subtle body through this practice. It's not pre-given. It's something that you grow and you exercise and you develop through certain forms of work. Was that Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche? It is, yeah. It was great. I, I found his work around the same time I found Ken's and that was a, a huge, a huge discovery. His, his book. Yeah. Uh, I haven't, Nice story from that. I think I've shared elsewhere, but not to you, um, which was I was in India working at a Krishna Murthy school and teaching there. And every now and then I would go up to Nepal and I was seeking out some Dzogchen teachings. And uh, I met a teacher up there that I really, you know, made a connection with. And I asked to live with him and, and, and study. And he said, go back and complete your American Dharma of getting your education finished then you can come back here and live all you want. So I went back and within a couple of weeks, I met another Dzogchen teacher who was Tenzin Wangyal. And it turns out Tenzin Wangyal was raised as a son by this guy who had sent me back to Texas. So <laughs> there was a nice connection right there. And my first real deep exploration of Ken Wilbur was actually while living at Tenzin Wangyal's house. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, those are just a couple of examples of, of uh, her, like, there are plenty of other hermetic schools in which the idea of the development of this body is the the goal of the practice, you know. And so I think y'all are right to, to note that there does seem to be some divergence here in thinking around whether the the point is to develop a body that coheres for the purposes of reseeding into an, you know, a, another gross body or whether this is something that happens, you know, kind of spontaneously. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I love what you were mentioning, Layman, about um, the Gurdjieffian model and having watched people wake up to different of their own bodies. It makes a lot of sense to me that the bodies are pre-existing as a potential, but they need to be filled with awareness and with energy in order to be brought into perception and actual conscious awareness. Like I've just seen so many times that uh, someone move from the gross reductive mind into the subtle body and they say, holy shit, I can feel energy. Like that's an experience that is indicating to me that they didn't just birth a subtle body. The subtle body was there, but it actually got filled up enough or their mind got tuned enough or quiet enough to actually track the experience of, oh, there it is. I knew it conceptually, but now I, I own it in my bones. Um, so I think that that makes a lot of sense. But I also think that there's a, a missing piece of this that, you know, the if someone doesn't inhabit the causal body, they don't have a soul seems a bit messy to me. Um, <laughs> there seems to be some maybe morphogenic feels, but but guide rails of what happens to this person as we disintegrate out of the physical form and merge back into whatever happens on the other side. There's a, a, a well-worn groove of that process that we don't need to be controlling. So we don't need to have the, the soul awakened in order for that process to occur. But there is natural phenomenon that are inherent in the universe to guide that process. Yeah, it's complex. And, uh, you know, especially when you bring time and involution back into the question. Yep. I think Gurdjieff chooses, like many of the great teachers, a, um, an inherently provocative way of phrasing <laughs> And what I like about the way he phrases it is that it takes away, you know, we always say like, does everyone have a soul and go to an afterlife or does <laughs> no one have a soul and no one goes to an afterlife? Well, those aren't the only options. It could be some people <laughs> under some conditions. Right? And we certainly, when we look at the physical body, right, you, you have a physical body when you're a zygote, but it can't do most of the things we associate with an adult human being. Yeah. So we could say you don't have a soul, or we could say there's various functions of a soul, or we could say there's some aspects that maybe we call soul and maybe we don't. Like if I think about my physical body growing and changing and acquiring capacities, but then also decomposing, I think, well, I could have a subtle form that could potentially undergo those same things. But when I think about a causal form, I find I'm thinking about something that's almost by definition transtemporal or, or in a different relationship to time, right? That it's part of the computational signature of whatever it means to refer to me. And that's not brought into the world or taken out of the world because it doesn't make sense to speak about it in those terms. But if, if, I mean, if that's what I mean by soul, then it's always active whether I know it or not. If some kind of version of subtle energy is what I mean by soul, then that undergoes a series of changes that may or may not occur. Directs me that, that there's a sense in which this could be compressed by the statement, there's a, there's a place in heaven for dead babies. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, because like that, that, that is a kind of a, a persistent thought, and even in, in sort of, you know, Western traditions, you know, that there is, well, well, but they didn't, you know, they didn't have, I, I guess, what happens to them? They weren't baptized yet. You know, that, that whole thing. I think heaven is a really interesting thing to bring into this because one of the things Wilbur does not do in this section is touch on subtle realms or domains. Uh, right. And we might say, well, there's, you know, everybody dies and everybody can potentially access a transcendental or a causal an infinity or a void or a deep reconciliation with being that may be available at all moments. But if we're thinking specifically about some other place that's made of massless qualitative material of some kind, is it really there? Where is it? Can it be organized into heavens or hells or bardo realms is it fundamentally simply responsive to our own subjectivity? Does What's it have living in it? Without us? <laughs> what do we all think? Are there heavens and hells? <laughs> this was well. The funny thing. Okay, I, I'm not, not trying to hug the mic here, but my God, this was 
I think, and you know, Stuart Davis obviously feels this way. Uh, Sean Harkins feels this way that this is like the, one of the weirdest blind spots in Ken's work that he just absolutely refuses to discuss UFOs. You know, I mean, he talks about it like sometimes, but it's with such curt dismissal. It's bizarre. And it's, and, 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 you know, it's like, well, you know, I've graduated beyond caring about that stuff is the, is what I've heard him say on the matter. Even in some of his earlier work, it's sort of like, yeah, those things are real, but never mind, you know, and, and yet you, how are you going to have a taxonomy of the subtle energy route, like all of this stuff without talking about an actual taxonomy of the denizens of these spaces, you know, and, and I've, you know, to the extent that I can, you know, I probably some of my, my most pertinent and, and intense and transformative uh, you know, subtle energy experiences involved specifically the uh, awareness of the detection of and, and communication with beings that are like, I, you know, I, I remember sitting there watching one of these things thinking, okay, now can I, can I shoot it down like a duck? I don't think I can. Like if, if, you know, if I, if I could, would like, would I find something on the ground? You know, these are, these are important questions. So yeah, good call. Yeah. That reminds me when Bruce and I spoke with Ken, I, I brought up this question and he was, he was very open to it, but also not very interested in doing anything about that. I think he said uh, something like, listen, if I have to add a ninth quadrant, I'll add a ninth quadrant, but you and Sean should do this. <laughs> he doesn't great. consider it to be his work. I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> yeah, Sean's definitely... Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, I, I was going to say, he does briefly mention it in Religion of Tomorrow, saying that, you know, and, and it's been my feeling too, that if we have uh, a heaven of the amber level of development of different religions and they contain angels and demons, the orange level of development doesn't really have a subtle realm, a subtle space with deities. So the Western culture has taken a lot of that and put in technological beings that are highly rational, you know, extremely advanced. And a lot of that alien phenomenon, he believes, lives at that level of the the subtle space. I can't remember where it is in Religion of Tomorrow, but there's a a paragraph, maybe two, in there. <laughs> That's a relief to hear on some level, you know. Yeah. And 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 I mean in a way, he's kind of just cribbing from William Irwin Thompson again in saying that, you know, in in in, in uh Thompson's critiques of Zechariah Sitchin and his his uh his talk of misplaced concreteness, you mm. know, and, and the projection of of a you know technological identity into this, you know, into those spaces. Yeah. There's something about uh, subtle phenomenon that seems to involve synchronicities that operate in a way they cut across the quadrants and things like that in my discussions with sean a, a lot of it's been around like it uh, is the quadrant diagram a, an adequate ontology to describe what these anomalous phenomena are because by their very nature they seem to not quite be subjective and not quite be objective and yet multiple people can see them and they right, there's a kind of fluid nature to them but also there's a strong sense of correlation right jung was trying to make this argument about synchronicity back in the day. there's some other way to do causal connecting that isn't quite the same way we do it in linear time bruce told that story about coming back and meeting that other monk and you know all these sorts of things many of the phenomena that we point to that we think of as subtle are phenomena where seemingly scattered events have some kind of similar resonance to each other but maybe that the, you know, that synchronicity as opposed to diachronicity is a window into thinking about what that domain is. Well, again, this is where we need to bring Eric Wargo into the conversation because Eric's whole uh, premise for time loops is that uh, he's providing something better than an a causal principle for synchronicity by saying that the you know, th this is the way that organisms orient themselves in a, f you know, four-dimensional Minkowski block space-time in order to 
basically in like a kind of a Carl Friston free energy principle, you know, the, the, like the, uh, living systems as uncertainty reduction engines, right? Like that's why there's this thermodynamic, like why we have waste heat, right? Is, is because the entropy is being exported in order to, to, uh, construct a niche of reduced entropy within you know the the bounds the in, the mutual information bounds of the the system and so like he's saying and Jacques Vallée also has said similarly that that this that you know there may be something about this uh and this is why so many precognitive experiences like basically all precognitive experiences including the ones that Jung talks about and Eric, Eric makes this point in the book are experiences of some future reward be it i didn't get on the plane uh i met my future wife like my own some of my own most pronounced uh, precognitive experiences involved meeting my children before they were born and and so you know this is a way that that Wargo is saying that that beings anchor themselves they bind time they anchor you know they they uh minimize the and, and he, he gives an explanation for addiction in this respect where he's saying that that this is the way that uh, in in like a Lacanian jouissance kind of sense that the pain is actually pleasure because it is a sure thing that you're going to be drunk tomorrow night. And so many precognitive people are in fact addicts of one of one flavor or another. Um, so there's there's an interesting piece to that. I don't know. In terms of you know. What's going on, whether it's a temporal looping or whether there's something else. I, I want to bring in another anecdote. I've, I've been skeptical generally of, of the idea of, you know, these detachable subtle bodies. It, you know, it seems like a holdover, even though within the tra traditions I've studied in, they do clearly indicate that the more that you master this domain of practice, the more that you're actually able to locomote in real ways in the world and observe things detachable from your body, right? I was in Indonesia, and uh, I had not communicated with home for a long time. And uh, one night I was, you know, sleeping in the ashram and having a dream, and something dropped in front of my dream, like a superimposing itself on the dream screen. And it was so much more real, so much more vibrantly present. It, it felt like a an invasion and a little interruption of the dream state, but I was still asleep and still dreaming. And it was just looking me in the face. It was an entity looking me in the face. And I woke up. It was as real as if you're watching a screen on the movie theater and someone stands up, you know, in the seat in front of you and blocks the view. And you know that this is the real person. And that was just the entertainment. That's the ontological feel that I had that I was really interrupted by an actual three-dimensional presence and it disturbed me and I, I walked around my room and said get out get out you're not welcome here go away because um, I didn't know what in the world that was but it felt like a real intrusion or invasion in my dream space to, to me that speaks to the real need to uh, be non-homogenous in our thinking about this and I guess I've mentioned that in a few different ways Right, like the dream world. What is it? Well, there seem to be very distinct different kinds of domains that are present. A lot of it seems like very trivial regurgitation of what your brain's doing, but then sometimes you get these breakthroughs into what seem like whole different terrains of dreaming. Likewise, when we're talking about subtle energies, right? Are chi and prana the same? You know, I had a teacher who would talk a lot about Jing and Qi and Shen, this kind of thing, right? When Wilbur's at least trying to make distinctions. And I think that's one of the minimal places we need to start, even if we agree or disagree with his particular distinction making. Yeah, I think it's important. And just to finish that little part, because I got a corroboration that made me hold this differently, which is I, I called home a few days later and my mom asked me, did anything weird happen to you on this date? And I said, uh, oh, I had this really weird dream. Somebody interrupted my dream. About she just started laughing because she said, on that date, I asked a shaman to come check on you because I hadn't heard from you for so long. And uh, they told me that they located you, that you were okay, but that you were really mad about being disturbed. Uh, well, here's an anecdote. I, this happened to me when I was a teenager was, 
uh, I had this dream and there was a sort of recurring Lord of the Underworld character that had been haunting my dream for a couple of weeks until I figured out what to do about him. But he was there and uh, death had come as his servant and death had taken possession of Sherlock Holmes and the wall split open and he pulled him away and it was horrifying. Uh, and I kind of, uh, you know, when you like scream, but you can't really scream. And then you, you make yourself scream a little bit and it wakes you up. And then I was laying there immobile in my bed and the face of this grotesque death gargoyle from the dream was there in my room on the wall. And I don't know how long I looked at it for, but slowly I came to and I thought, well, I, I took it as psychological. Right. I, I was young and I thought, well, this is probably my anxiety about losing rational control of myself symbolized by Sherlock Holmes. And, and I get up and I go to breakfast and my mother's got the radio on. And it turns out that Jeremy Brett, who played Sherlock Holmes on the BBC when I was a kid, was the quintessential Sherlock Holmes, died in the middle of the night. <laughs> and then I had to suddenly question whether personal psychology was the appropriate interpretation of the phenomenon. <laughs> But clearly it was a phenomenon that doesn't care about some of our usual basic distinctions between ontological domains. Hmm. Wow. I mean, that's exactly like the story that Wargo tells in time loops about how Alec Guinness met James Dean the week that he bought the car that he ultimately died in. And upon meeting James Dean, Alec Guinness was possessed with this urge to warn him to get rid of the car as soon as possible. It was like, please, like he implored this guy that he had just met, please, please get rid of this car or you will die in it. And then a week later it had happened. And so, you know, this is, again, that's like part of the, there's always something entropic about these, these precognitive sentiments. Bruce, your story is interesting, kind of in a different way, you know, because I, and Matt, I'd, I'd be curious, basically this is just an open call because at first I thought you were telling the story of a haunting hmm. and you know, I've, I've had a haunting and it was another one of these, these kind of um, this actually happened in right after college and right before a, my string of UFO experiences, but maybe as almost like a pre prerequisite course before I got to have the UFO experiences, you know, that I was living in a house with a poltergeist and my, my it was uh, living upstairs in the third floor. I lived on the second and it was shaking my buddy's bed at night and waking him up. And it, it ultimately manifested in a series of, uh, uh, we never like there were vandalisms of my a mutual vandal multiple vandalisms of my car as well as someone breaking in the front door of our house while I was there and no one came in and there was no evidence that anyone had been there and the only thing that the only other thing that had been destroyed was this series of hanging bells that my my uh, partner had given me but it, it like it all sort of started to piece together because you, you you poltergeists are often correlated with, uh, you know, em the emotionally disturbed, you know, and there's also this whole thing about the shoemakers, elves and, and brownies and, and, you know, these things in European lore about uh, these, these house, these domestic spirits that act up when someone is off the path. And at the time in my life, this was around when I was like tr struggling to find my way into grad school. And the only thing keeping me in Lawrence, Kansas was this relationship. And so it was, you know, th there was like interesting damage done to the, this token, this, this symbol of, of the relationship. Um, and, and oh, it was funny because that was the, the autumn that I went to integral life practice seminar and learned the three, two, one shadow integration process, and then came back to Lawrence and ultimately worked uh, a shadow integration protocol on the poltergeist and have since had this ongoing and ever more deeply developed relationship with something that I will never know for sure. I don't think whether it is part of me in any kind of way I can, you know, formalize that or whether it was something that uh, became part of like an endosymbiont, like, you know, that I'm now a holobiont that includes this, this thing that was originally other and has you know become part of me and if those and if those distinctions even make sense when you spin the whole thing on the temporal axis right like we've been talking about and you you look at this as a, as you know a a process uh 
in the Alan Watts sense of like regarding a symphony, you don't, you don't critique a symphony uh, synchronically, you, you, you know, or like diachronically, you look at the whole thing all at once. So yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's, I'd be curious who's got a good ghost story, you know, or like this, <laughs> this kind of thing. Yeah. Well, before trying to retrieve ghost story anecdotes, I mean, one of the things that pops out to me is this, uh, like anecdotes in general represent um, bits of this phenomenon that have stood out to us. And we lose track of all the bits of it that don't stand out to us. Right. Just like we're saying, you're talking like, can we form these other bodies and act through them? Well, we may be doing so, but that doesn't mean we're consciously doing so. We may be retrieving information from them at all times, right? Are we, when we think of coincidences, we think of big coincidences that stood out in the foreground, not the coincidence of the fact that I'm in this chair and it coincidentally is not collapsing, right? Like everything <laughs> is built out of coincidence. And I think, I mean, Wilbur does an interesting thing in this chapter where he talks about how the subtle is always already present with everything, but that the content of the subtle is added by these unfolding stages. One of the things I think that is added by unfolding stages is an appreciation of, of a more expansive sense of what that subtle content is, so that many things we didn't previously perceive as being subtle content are subtle content. Right, like this old philosophical question about like what is redness as opposed to things being red. Well, we all perceive redness all the time. We don't think about it as a mysterious, subtle quality, but it is a mysterious, subtle quality, right? We don't know how many aspects of what we think of as regular perception are actually pervaded by uncanny, poetic, anomalous, massless uh, kinds of phenomenon because it fits into what we think of the world as being. So I would be, I would caution us about theorizing based only on the bits that stand out to us as uncanny when most of it must fit in and not get noticed. You should go on weird studies. <laughs> I, I think there's something really interesting there. And, and I want to see if I can tie a couple threads together that we've talked about. And Bruce, you were talking about synchronicity and the four quadrants and what's happening in fields. And, you know, part of the way this, this appeals to my mind is if we take the four quadrants and we lay it on its back, right? And we stack the states on top of it, essentially what starts to happen is you reach an apex at non-duality. So as you climb from gross realm through the four quadrants to, you know, through the states, all the lines separating the quadrants get a little kind of messy, right? So you have an event in the subtle or the causal space. And because we have Kronos and we have Kairos of time, those things become much less linear and Kairos and Kronos start to kind of merge into being the same thing. So synchronicity seems to me to be arising from a four quadrant perspective because the, the hard linear boundaries of those quadrants are breaking down and phenomena are becoming phenomena across all, all four quadrants. And then also breaking what we would perceive as linear temporal barriers. So you have, uh, and my language in this is, I promise will be messy. <laughs> you have kind of this, this mushiness of how do I, first of all, experience this through a, a logical reductionistic mind, you know, let the mind do what the mind does. And then subjectively, how is my body actually experiencing it, which is also very different and not necessarily quite as temporal. One of the things that's of interest to me is whether that, um, convergent movement toward blurry lines uh, is actually a journey from what we would anciently call gross subtle causal non-dual, whether there's only one trajectory or whether you could start at any one of those. And if you keep adding states, you get that effect, right? Mm -hmm. We have these ideas like transmigration is the idea of the subtle agent showing up and then getting a gross body added to mm -hmm. it. Right. And avatar is the idea of a non-dual entity that has to sort of achieve gross realm embodiment somehow. So you could hypothetically, especially if you take Wilbur Combs matrix really seriously, think that you could start from any of these directions. We just traditionally start from a gross realm story and that this blurring of the ontological lines between the quadrants may be an effect of the increasing convergence and inclusion of material from all these realms and not necessarily of a journey from one realm to another. 
I, I love that. And I think that in, in a sense, we're telling the story of the universe, right? Like we're, we're starting from, from the big bang and complexifying and then essentially returning back into a single point of unity. So I think that that's constantly always happening in the waves and cycles, but then there's always backwashes and eddies of, you know, are the angels trying to manifest down into a body as we're trying to climb up into, you know, awareness of all the things that we are. So I, without sounding uh, like maybe I'm not giving a specific answer. I think it's always happening all the time. <laughs> That's another thing that, that Bill Thompson really exfoliated and, and uh, you know, m properly exposed in his, his work, you know, the, the notion of, like Titans being replaced by gods, gods being replaced by humans, humans being replaced by machines mm -hmm. has this, you know, it follows this, what in, in complex system science, they're going to call a, a max ent sort of uh, process, you know, or, or it's maximum, maximal entropy pr uh, production, which is why you see, uh, you know, the fractal patterns of river basins are the same things that are going on inside, in, inside your lung as a way of, of dissipating heat and, and, and uh, atmospheric gas exchange, you know, because it's, it's, it's uh, Ilya Prigogine's dissipative structures. And so there's, there's a sense in which that, you know, the, the, the whole thermodynamic piece of this, to the extent that it seems like it pertains to all of these other you know, the, the subtle energies also is that um, it is a, it is a, a falling down that is also a building up. And both of those things are going on constantly at the same time. I gave a talk at Burning Man in 2013 about this actually, and about how you see, you, you can tell a lot about a culture by the way that it's polarized around this issue by regarding things as uh, a narrative of progress or a narrative of the f like a uh, successive uh, fall, mm. you know, and, and that, you know, d different, different sects in, in a number of given religions uh, tend to want to see kind of myopically what, you know, what, you know, they're cutting a slice through again, what is probably better understood in more of a toroidal metaphor. I think the question of whether entropy exists in the subtle domain is fascinating, right? And I would tie it to the fact that subtle entities seem to be very protean, right? There seems to be a change of form over time, and maybe they're trying to discharge entropy by shifting the form of the same quality of manifestation. At the same time, Bill Thompson talks about the, you know, the, this whole thing about, you know, uh, angels wanting to incarnate uh, or gods envying the human realm, you know, has to do with the fact that there is a, a sense in which, as you, you alluded to earlier, that, you know, that we are time bound and, and constrained and limited spatiotemporally in a way that they're not. So like, you know, the Greek gods never learn they never, you know, they keep having these, they're like celebrities. They just have these dramas over and over and like they did, they never actually get any better. And so, you know, that's, that's the whole, you know, that's Ken's constantly hammering on, on that about that's why God wants to be a million different pieces instead of, you know, a, a perfect whole and complete thing unto itself. There's a great old Buddhist phrase about this precious human birth. Right. The idea that the, the gross unit, especially if you have an advanced to neurosystem, gives you leverage over your subtle self that you might not otherwise have. <laughs> so if in the subtle world you find yourself in hell, you can't really do anything about that. But if you get one of these anchors, you might be able to change your trajectory for when you go back. <laughs> I can't tell you how much my ego loves that idea. <laughs> Well, that's like that's like uh, Tom Robbins in, in Jitterbug Perfume and, you know, talking about, the, you know, God's depending on attention. And that's like so Old Testament. That's that's, you know, please, you got to worship me. You know, uh, why would you need that? And then and the funny thing is that, you know, just to, to pin this to again to personal experience. When I say that I saw my kids before they were born, my sense was that I, I, I first encountered them in the form of like an egregore 
between me and my wife, uh, you know, some kind of, it was very confusing uh, for me when I first experienced this in 2007. And it took years for me to sort of make, you know, over a decade for me to make sense of that this was, there was a sense in which I had observed a, a demigod or, a, you know, a minor deity that had in some way that I couldn't fully comprehend was both like ontologically prior and posterior to me and my partner. And that it was, uh, it was, it needed us to stay together in order to instantiate itself. And uh, it needed us to attend to it. And so I spent 10 years trying to, to shoo this thing away um, before she and I decided we were going to make another one kind of on purpose rather than on accident. And uh, not long after we did that, we ended up with two kids that were the, these two things. And so it, again, it was this, uh, you know, created or discovered. That was the big, that was a huge piece of the synchronicity of the, the revelation of the first of these, which I talked about in, in Future Fossils 37 with um, Mike, uh, Michael Jacobs, the ungoogleable Michelangelo, where we're talking about this, this thing I, at the time I, I called the angel squid. Um, I now call him Ian. He's a, he's a little kid. Uh, he's keeping me up last night. That this thing was a big part of that experience was that at the end of the day, I put on uh, Apple uh, iTunes Shuffle and the song that came up was Bjork's Modern Things in which she says, Moder the modern things have always been there. They're waiting in a mountain. You know, they're, I, I forget the exact words, but she says they're waiting in a mountain for the right time. For that, for them to emerge from this mountain, and the mountain that she's talking about is this, uh, is like the inverted evolutionary manifold, you know. So that was a strange piece of 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 that whole revelation. Hmm. At a retreat one time, my wife had a dream that uh, she was standing by a river, and she looked down and she saw three colored stones in the water. And she reached down to pick up the, the three colored stones. And as she did that, this luminous white God rose out of the water, kind of an all pure white colored entity rose out of the, the, the water and, and hovered in the sky above her. And she told that to the uh, Lama that was there. And he said, oh, you're going to have a son within a year. And we had no idea we were, were pregnant, but... Uh, it turned out she was. We found out she was pregnant about two weeks later. So wow. that's interesting. I, I that the right before I had the vision, it was it was about six months before we found out my wife was pregnant, I mean, before she became pregnant. Uh, and I, at the time, I thought that she and I were going to break up. Uh, this has been going on, you know, catastrophically for years, but. I, I was having this thought about, again, this, this being that I had sort of integrated that had originally been, you know, manifesting itself and slamming doors and breaking things in the house. And I was beginning to worry that maybe it was, in fact, something I'd let in that I shouldn't have. And I, I spoke to my mother's friend who's, a, a part, you know, a really uh, developed psychic. And she said to me, in part of her sensing of my, you know, my situation. She, she said, uh, I don't know, the image is coming to me of, for some reason of three white stones or three eggs. And then also, like later that weekend, I had a vision of these two kids, you know, uh, separated in age precisely as they are, gendered as they, as they are. And at the time I thought it was, you know, I, I thought it was like a world I was letting go of. I didn't realize it was the world I was stepping into. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. There's something about the, the three stones that I find really fascinating, just in the sense of the this this you know the triadic uh, piece of of manifestation. In fact, you know, one of the 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 UFO experiences I had in 2006 gave me basically an integral download in which it said that uh, paradox is resolved by adding a dimension perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you have uh, something that doesn't make sense with two points of view, you add a third and then it showed, it is like, and then a question, a paradox 
to so, an, an object line existing on a plane is resolved by adding a fourth perspective and creating a tetrahedron and that these are built out indefinitely which is which is basically exactly what ken's doing with integral calculus you know and and so you know that's uh and it's like and that's why marital counselors work right and that's why governance is structured the way that it is and so there's something about about the sacred numeral like the sacred number three that it shows up in michael schneider's beginner's guide to constructing the universe he talks about how three is always the where they talk about the two parents and the child you know that you get there's like there's a third thing and alex gray you know talks about this and has painted this in his work and showing how that like then you get the holy family and it's like mm -hmm. a new a new structure is uh you know assembled in that uh, i could go down the pathway of talking about the uh phantasmal unborn daughter that played the role of a third between myself and my girlfriend. But I want to touch on uh, <laughs> something that's a little bit more structurally related to the chapter in the, in the little bit of time we have left, because there's this sense in which you can go uh, up through bodies to bioelectricity, and then you hit this, you hit the vital etheric, <laughs> and then you go up toward the astral. And then maybe you go into psychic and causal domains. But if I take that, privileged vertical stack off the table then it looks a little bit different i still think there's there's something very pertinent to imagining the subtle as as a gradient that runs from uh something like vital to something like astral and you could imagine that the astral touches the causal at a place where the trinity becomes a unity but I, I'm thinking of the of, of this, you know, this this notion of the subtle as going from the body uh, through this vitality to this subtleness, and then somewhere in that subtleness, there's a special configuration of the subtle which shows where it connects to the causal, mm -hmm. uh, which is a beautiful idea. But I think we need to widen the lens and imagine that any part of the subtle, be it the vital, be it the astral, could access the gross, could access the causal, could access the non-dual, and it would have specific formal and qualitative elements that indicated that it was being sutured to that other domain at that place. Right on. I mean, I got to scoot, but I just, it feels like a right time to just thank you uh, for convening this conversation and thank you all for being such brilliant and interesting people. And to thank Ken for giving us a reason to to talk about this complicated and and difficult and fascinating piece. So yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, good to see you, yeah. man. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And one point related to your thing about uh, perspectives and the addition of perspectives and the, the math there. Some people know, not everybody knows that that's part of how Ken's perspectival math was born was a subtle level of experience taking a psychotropic medication uh basically and and having a, a vision of a luminous spider that other people in the room were also beholding and it wasn't physically there in in the all all the senses of it but it was there for multiple perspectives to be taken on this luminous spider in the center of the room and it got him thinking about okay what's going on in terms of the manifestation of 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 different types of reality relative to perspectives, you know, what needs to be going on for us to physically interact with something, whereas this seems to be an in-between space where we can sit in different places and look at it, but it's not available to our grasp, you know, and so he started thinking about the layering of perspectives and that led him, as far as I understand, in the direction of his calculus. Well, how come that's not in the Grace and Grit movie? No <laughs> oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> He's just he's just traumatized from his Midwestern upbringing and not talking about all the weird shit that he's seen, I, I suspect. Uh, anyway, thanks again, guys. And I think this has been both a wonderful ride and probably a glorious mess. We've been all over the place, but, <laughs> but it's been a delight. Yeah, is there anything else that um, either of you'd like to, to kind of bring in to try to tie some of these crazy threads together? I don't think I want to try to tie them together, but I want to appreciate uh, everybody who's participated in this and the the really fertile open questions that we're collectively standing in front of and sensing. And like Michael said, Ken, for giving us this thing to play off of mm. and uh, touch back in on what I said at the beginning is this is a tough thing to do, a balancing act, right? If you want to 
uh, embrace the reality of the subtle, which is a big risk because you're going to turn off a whole bunch of people, but you're also going to say, let's think it through carefully. Then you're going to turn off a bunch of people who love the subtle. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a very narrow spot to be working in and it's a big risk and it's a big challenge. I appreciate him for trying and I appreciate all of us for trying as well. Same, same. And, and maybe uh, just recognizing that, you know, one of, one of my backgrounds is having studied Zen since 1999. And I, I, at the same time, I can hear my brain operating and chewing on all this. I can hear the whole Zen lineage just kind of laughing and saying, ha, 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 ha go back and sit on the mat. So I think that there's, <laughs> you know, there's another opportunity for us to say, well, how do we make this meaningful? And, and that's a different conversation altogether, for sure. Um, but just prefacing that, it, you know, the, the excerpt itself has the opportunity to make the subtle experience meaningful for people. And what are you going to do with it? And I think that that would be an interesting place to, to head at some point in the future. Yeah. There's two parts of that jump up. Like one is this, how do you make it meaningful? How do you do something with it? And then the other part of that Zen thing is, well, the non-dual doesn't give a fuck about the subtle. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Keep sitting, face the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's something that Ken talks about in, I think it's in the religion of tomorrow, about how some traditions develop knowledge of the subtle and Mm -hmm. some traditions don't. And he points out how, I think it was Hakuin who faced some kinds of energetic and other kinds of troubles in his meditation that eventually a Taoist master helped him resolve through a certain visualization and energy circulation kind of practice that so Ken was pointing it out. Yeah, certain non-dual traditions don't need it in in one sense. That's my drawing of Hakuin. Oh, awesome! <laughs> <I love Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but in another sense, it leaves a gap where sometimes yeah, yeah. things are happening in your experience that if you had knowledge of that domain, um, you could move through it yeah. more readily. Yeah. That was but exactly that, exactly yeah. my experience it, moving straight into studying Zen and the the causal opening up and then having to go back as a energy practitioner and learn the whole subtle space. Yeah, because the causal and the non-dual, although we need to realize them, they're fine on their own. <laughs> they're doing <laughs> what okay. What we need to do is to bring <laughs> them into the gross and the subtle and repattern these realms on that basis. Yeah. Amen. Well, that sounds like a good place to end. I want to give a little plug for what Sean Hargens is now doing at the California Institute of Human Sciences, which is basically opening up a whole university department around subtle energy studies and exo studies. So I think some good things will be going on over there. I want to check in with him about some of that a little bit later on another episode. So I also want to say that uh, what we've done here, Bruce, like this is the final mutual exploration and revisiting of Wilbur's excerpts. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's a really unique project. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we've, we've done a very strange thing in doing this series, and I'm very happy that we've done it. <laughs> You're here. Me too. Yeah. All right. Well, take care. Thanks all. Cheers, guys.